As a matter of fact, if we had our choice, we never would have gone close to Miranda. In order to get to Neptune, we were uh, obliged to go a particular distance from Uranus in order to get the right gravitational deflection on the spacecraft. Well, it turned out that that distance was exactly the distance that Miranda's orbit is from Uranus. It is a very exotic and complicated place. Most of the regions that we uh, viewed are heavily cratered, old, rolling, ancient terrains. But embedded in these are very unusual, uh, circular patches, almost like racetracks of groove terrains that run around in circular bands surrounding very complicated uh, crisscrossing structures in the interiors. We address the, uh, the question, what can we do to hear the data better? We did come up with a technique called arraying, where we took existing antennas and electronically wired them together so that in fact it had the appearance of being one larger antenna. And uh, we did that uh, in Australia, the primary receiving site at, at Uranus, and combined the uh, uh, DSN's stations with a borrowed antenna from the Australian radio, radio astronomy community uh, at Parks. Radio fine, Mark. Uh, stand by, Parks. While we were moving from Uranus to Neptune on the ground, we had two major things to do. First of all, we reprogrammed the software on board the spacecraft to do two things. To stabilize the spacecraft so that the pictures would not be smeared and to add some new techniques to the spacecraft that would allow it to pan and track the, the planet when we were taking pictures near the planet. Second thing we had to do was improve the communications capability. Uh, we did that since, the, since Neptune is twice as far away from a communication standpoint as Uranus. Uh, we did that by enlarging the size of the antennas on the Earth and by adding several new sets of antennas into our deep space network to help compensate for the distance. It is mission accomplished for Voyager 2. The space probe is headed out of the solar system tonight after photographing parts of the universe no one had ever seen before. Now we had some hints from Earth-based observations that Neptune had a few clouds and at least that was better than Uranus. But we really weren't prepared for the spectacular weather activity that uh, Voyager found. In fact, Neptune is the windiest planet in the solar system, and I was totally unprepared for that. The winds are 325 meters per second. That's the speed that the great dark spot is moving relative to the inside of Neptune. Everything's going to the east, but the great dark spot is going more slowly to the east than the inside of Neptune. We had expected because Neptune does, is not tipped on its side as a planet, but is an upright planet, that the magnetic field axis would, axis would be aligned with the rotation axis. That is, the poles would be near the rotational pole. We were surprised again. The magnetic field is tilted by 47 degrees in the case of Neptune, and its center of the magnetic field is offset by almost two-thirds of the radius of the planet. Its magnetic field is somewhat weaker, only about half of that of Saturn's, for instance, at the surface. Uh, and its magnetic field extends only about 400,000 miles from its surface. We did uh, discover that the rotation period of the magnetic field uh, is about uh, 16 and, uh, hours and 7 minutes, faster than uh, Uranus, but slower than both Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, as we approached Neptune, we were approaching with the sun and the Earth almost directly behind us, so you could see a virtually a full disk of Neptune. And we aimed to go right over the North Pole, right up over the top of, of Neptune, very, very close to Neptune. The trajectory was then bent by gravity, moved south, and we intercepted Triton uh, while it was behind Neptune uh, and underneath it. Well, as we got closer and closer to Triton, it got smaller and smaller and smaller and at the same time brighter and brighter it turned out to be the brightest thing we've seen in the solar system north of the polar cap in the north just above the equator we find one thing we call the cantaloupe terrain uh, it has a uh, 
a system of crisscrossing ridges uh, which uh, uh, produce a set of almost squarish to ovoid dimples throughout the surface. Now we're talking about a surface which is 37 degrees above absolute zero. This is the coldest thing in the solar system by far. Even the cold atmospheres of things like Neptune are, are, are warmer. It was unthinkable to find activity going on a planet whose surface temperature is that low. I mean, this is getting down to a point where molecules stop. It was about a month after the Voyager encounter that uh, we were looking at uh, stereo images way down in the southernmost part of uh, Triton's polar cap. And we saw most of the features uh, lined up as if they were on a perfect sphere. In fact, the two best examples turn out to be active eruptions in which material is being blown from the surface in a vertical column to an altitude of uh, eight kilometers, roughly five miles. Voyager discovered six new moons at uh, Neptune. Uh, two of them were found in the uh, ring arc or ring system uh, orbiting uh, along two of the ring arcs. So uh, apparently shepherding uh, the edges of those ring arcs in some way. When we look at Neptune's ring system, as we can see here in this mosaic, we see three continuous rings quite easily. There is an outer ring. It's the ring in which, in fact, the three arcs are embedded. There is an inner ring which, at, in high phase geometry, appears brighter uh, than the outer ring. That tells us right away it's dusty, dustier than the outer ring. And then we see an inner, more diffuse ring at something like 42,000 kilometers from the center of, this, of the planet. We believe now that we'll be able to communicate with Voyager essentially as long as it stays alive. Two things will probably stop its life. First of all, it has a power source on board, which is a small nuclear power source called radioisotope thermal generators. And they operate by the, the radioactive decay of plutonium, which generates heat, which in turn is converted into electricity. In about 20 to 25 years, we expect to be low enough so that there's not enough power to keep the critical subsystems of the spacecraft operating. Or, at about the same time, we could possibly run out of attitude control fuel. That's the fuel which goes through little thrusters, which keeps the spacecraft stabilized and pointed at the Earth. Now, between the stars, there's a dilute gas, ionized gas, filling interstellar space. It's called the interstellar medium. Each star blows a bubble in that interstellar gas. Our own sun does that. That bubble, in the case of our sun, is called the heliosphere. We don't know how large that bubble is. It may be that the distance to the edge of the bubble, called the heliopause, is a hundred times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That is three times further than it is out to Neptune. In which case, 25 years, Voyager 1, which will at that point be 130 times as far from the Sun as the Earth, could well be returning data from interstellar space for the first time. There will be a part of Earth which will roam essentially forever in the galaxy, and that will be the Voyager spacecraft. <laughs>